Gracious God, let these words be more than words. Give us the spirit of Jesus. Amen. Please be seated. This week at the staff meeting when we were proofreading the Bible texts in the inserts, now the Reverend Mark Smith did what I just watched a number of you do. We were going through the gospel reading and he stopped about halfway through, stopped paying attention to the text and just scanned down to check who was preaching. <laughs> I'm sure his thoughts were in order. Oh, thank God, it's not me. And then what came out of his mouth when he said, Oh, Mike, the Bible, I'm sorry. <laughs> Today's readings are challenging, but I want to ask you not to give up. You have to do a bit of wrestling with these readings. And that's good for your soul. To be a Christian is to wrestle with the Bible. That has always been true. And these teachings in the gospel, they're from the less popular second half of the Sermon on the Mount. We can all get behind the first bit, the more beloved, blessed are the peacemakers. And Jesus' preaching in this section of Matthew is challenging. And I'm not going to be able to unpack all of it this morning. There's too much in there. So we're going to leave aside the dismemberment and the gouged out eyes. Uh, we'll do a sermon series or a teaching series someday. But I want to touch on just a couple of particularly difficult moments in this text. Jesus' teaching on divorce and Jesus' teaching on adultery. I want to spend time with these because they illustrate what I would consider to be an overall theme in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount and because they are touchstones in our culture's conversation with Jesus. In this section of the sermon, I want to propose to you, Jesus is talking about morality. And that word is difficult, morality. That word is difficult because for too long that word has been loaded. For too long, moral has been narrowly defined by a narrow group of Christians. As the Reverend Dr. William Barber, founder of the Moral Mondays movement in North Carolina says, we cannot let narrow religious forces hijack our moral vocabulary. Forces who speak loudly about things God says little about while saying so little about issues that are at the heart of all religious traditions, truth, justice, love, and mercy. The movement we most need, Dr. Barber says, the movement we most need is a moral movement. Dr. Will Ross just said about the same in our forum today, talking about healthcare inequity. We need a moral movement that looks at questions of justice, of mercy, of love, of truth. I would venture that in this country, too often, we've allowed a substitution to take place. Too often, we have allowed moralism to take the place of morality. Now, there's a big difference. Let me spell out the difference I'm talking about. Immorality, I would tell you, involves a hard inward look. If I'm really talking about morality, then I'm talking about teachings that ask me to examine my conscience to evaluate my thoughts, my behavior, and their consequences. Morality looks inwardly. Moralism looks out and looks down. Moralism comes from a place of assumed superiority. It looks down on the behavior of others. And practicing moralism in place of morality is dangerous. It leads to folks policing the speck in their neighbor's eye while ignoring the log in their own, as Jesus will say a little farther along in the sermon. I would venture that we in America, we in American Christianity, have survived several decades of moralism masquerading as morality. Don't be fooled. We still need morality. We could use a lot less moralism. With that distinction in place, let's talk about divorce. To understand Jesus' teaching about divorce, you have to understand that Jesus was working within a particular cultural framework, a particular cultural understanding of marriage. 
Now, I wrote a few pages of sermon about the first century argument between the rabbis Hillel and Shammai about divorce, and I decided to spare you. (laughs) What is interesting for us about the discussion is this. The Gospels differ in their reporting about Jesus. The understanding of divorce changes. The understanding of marriage changes, even just in the time it takes to move from one Gospel to the other. The New Testament scholar and Orthodox Jew Amy Jill Levine from Vanderbilt, she notes that Matthew is more permissive than Mark, the earlier gospel. Matthew allows divorce on the grounds of unchastity. Mark does not. Levine wonders whether in the years between when Mark was written down and when Matthew was written down, in those 30 years or so, when the Messiah still hadn't shown back up, whether folks needed a little more leeway in the Christian community. And so maybe Matthew was trying to give them some room. Marriage is always changing, Levine says. Our understanding of marriage has changed, thank God. We don't view women as property as they did in Jesus' time. Arguably, that understanding of marriage only really changed when women's right to vote was recognized. Marriage continues to change. Our church now blesses same-gender and mixed-gender marriages. Don't we need to reinterpret how we see divorce as well? (coughs) I've been ordained for almost a decade now, long enough that some of the marriages I've blessed have ended. I don't think that any couple I've married came up to the altar expecting to get divorced. (coughs) I think that people make their vows with all the best intentions, but sometimes we can't fulfill even our best intentions. I've known some good marriages, and I've known some very good divorces. Sometimes, sometimes I know divorce can be life-giving. Going through a divorce tends to be awful, but often the former partners find life on the other side they could not have found in their marriage. So I have to say, I've known some good divorces, some blessed divorces. I've known relationships where the moral thing to do was to be honest, to mourn the loss, and to allow the marriage to end. What couples who have been divorced do not need is moralistic Christians telling them they are sinners. Speaking up and saying, this isn't working, this is over, it takes courage. Ending a partnership, dissolving a marriage, distributing assets and debts, figuring out how to continue caring for kids if there are kids, that's a heavy load. We tend to treat divorcing couples like toxic sludge. Wouldn't it be the more moral thing to do, the Christian thing? Wouldn't it be to lean in, to bake casseroles, to set up playdates, to help folks know that they are still loved, still supported? Wouldn't that say more about the God we believe in, whose property is always to have mercy, as the prayer book tells us? Wouldn't embrace be more moral than judgment? As a community, as a culture, we often fail folks who are going through divorce. Folks go through one of the most vulnerable experiences of their lives, and church and people of faith are not a source of comfort, but rather a source of moralistic judgment and we wonder why the church is shrinking. But here's the even more difficult bit. The moralism is really a defense mechanism, isn't it? The judgment is meant to wall out the questions being raised. When a couple with whom we are close divorces, it tends to raise questions for us about our own relationships, about our own capacity for love, about our own sexual lives. And if a couple divorces and we know that divorce is healthier than the marriage, well, that might cause us to question our dogmatic understandings of marriage. So we better build a wall. We better draw a line in the sand. But that's just the opposite of what Jesus is doing in this sermon. Throughout the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is tearing down the whole infrastructure of narrow dogmatic thinking. Jesus is ripping out the baseboards. So long as we're talking about sex and relationships today, let's look at the shocking words Jesus says about adultery. 
I went back and read this week a famous interview with then, pre then presidential candidate Jimmy Carter. He gave the interview to Playboy magazine in 1976. I may be one of the few people you can believe when he tells you that I read Playboy for the articles. <laughs> Old joke. You can get the whole interview online and you don't have to verify that you're 18. Though it is hosted at playboy.com, so be careful if you go read it at work. In the interview, President Carter famously quoted Jesus in Matthew's Gospel. He said this, I've looked on a lot of women with lust. I've committed adultery in my heart many times. That's the line everybody remembers from the interview, partly because it appeared in Playboy magazine, lust in print, at least for some. Carter's interview was remarkable. It, soon to be President Carter goes on to say, this is something God recognizes I will do, and God forgives me for it. God, or Carter also says that the point of Jesus' teaching on adultery is to help folks know that the playing field is level. Whether you've had an affair, or 20, or you've been technically faithful while still lusting in your heart, we are all sinners. We don't get to judge. Judgment is for God and God is forgiving, the soon-to-be president reminded us. <coughs> Excuse me. I agree with Jimmy Carter. God is forgiving. <coughs> and what Jimmy Carter gets, what is clear across that whole interview, what I think Jesus is working through the length of this section on the Sermon on the Mount is this. Motives matter. Having an honest assessment of our motivation matters. The interview doesn't end with Jimmy Carter's confession that he sinned, though that's what everybody remembers. The interview ends with a reframing of what is said up until then, it's been dominated by this discussion of adultery and sex. Carter says that because of his faith, because of his understanding of Christ's teaching, because he knows that he's not perfect, because he knows he will fall short, he says, I don't think I would ever take on the same frame of mind that Nixon or Johnson did, lying, cheating, and distorting the truth. Motivation matters. If you have to be right, if you have to prove that your way was correct, if your motivation is to show that you are successful by showing others are not, then you are prone to distort the truth. Because the truth is that we all fall short sometimes. We're all vulnerable. So we can either acknowledge our vulnerability or live with dangerous delusions. We need more of that kind of morality. We need leaders willing to admit their faults and who are willing to make a change. I'm with Dr. Barber. I believe we need a moral movement in this country, we do. And like Dr. Barber, I know the last thing we need is a narrow moralistic movement, an excuse to judge and exclude others. I was listening to a recording of the late Professor Vincent Harding, theologian and civil rights leader this week. He talked about how part of the power of the civil rights movement could be expressed in the hymn we'll sing in just a little bit, This Little Light of Mine. He said that him expressed the hope of the movement, not to tear down anyone else, but to recognize God-given rights, the God-given light in each person. Each person had to look inwardly and then let their light shine out. These scripture readings are challenging because they're working to tear down, not any people, but tear down a way of doing religion that isn't working. <coughs> if you let him, if you let him, Jesus will tear down your moralism. If you let him, Jesus will tear down your desire to feel superior. If you let him, Jesus will tell you again and again, you are a sinner, and you are forgiven, and you are loved. If you let him, Jesus will take away all those ways of thinking that build up your self-image at the expense of others. If you let him, Jesus will take away all of those terrible judgments others have laid upon you as well. And Jesus will build something new in their place. Jesus will build something moral 
If we let him, Jesus will do what Jesus has always done. Jesus will build a movement for justice, for mercy, for love. If we let him, Jesus will redeem our lives, will show us the way to the wildly diverse, wildly forgiven, beloved community. If we let him, Jesus will save us. If we let him. Amen.